All right, hun. I love you, and we're here on top of the mountain again today. And I probably won't get to do many more on top of the mountain since winter's coming. Uh, but here we are, and we got really lucky. We saw some mountain goats today, your grandfather and I. If I get a chance, I'll splice those in so you can uh, take a look at them as, as well. I take some videos. So today we're going to talk about your natural law again and how that uh, pertains to mainstream medicine. So uh, here we go. We only respond to what we feel is most immediately life-threatening is the short version. And we're going to see how mainstream medicine fits in that. Before we get started, I want to let you know, though, a couple things. One of them, it's very difficult to criticize mainstream medicine. They're supposedly the advanced uh, medicine. They're, you know, new discoveries and new advancements. And, you know, I hate that word because in health, there's no advancement. There's just discovery. And uh, all these technical things uh, that we use for going to space, you know, having cell phones, things we've never been able to do before, are put in there, but they're all put in on an old framework that uh, is, is really outdated and something that for us to be more um, progressive, well, that's stupid, for us to be better at healing ourselves, uh, we got to get away from it. It's bankrupt. And so let's try that uh, as an explanation. However, I don't want you to get the idea that I don't use mainstream medicine. I do. And I, in fact, I wouldn't have started practicing if mainstream medicine wasn't there. Um, so, and, and if I need it, I'll use it. And I don't want you to totally throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing. The, you know, some of the emergency things I would definitely use still. Um, and maybe a surgery or something like that, depending. But I would also never stay with it. I would never use a medication, uh, you know, for years of my life if there was any other alternative. I would get away from it as quick as possible, and we're going to discuss exactly why that is today. So again, we only respond to what we feel is most immediately life-threatening. Let's take it in context to an age-old treatment uh, originally from mainstream medicine and let's look at it as uh, investigate it and see why it worked. So bloodletting, let's take that on. Bloodletting was used for over 3,000 years uh, as a very effective uh, treatment. In fact, it is really probably the most effective singular treatment for the most conditions of ailments and for the longest period of time having been effective and been utilized. In this country, uh, the, the birth of this country and through the beginning of the country, the first 100, 150 years, um, <laughs> bloodletting, we used it more than any other country in the world. Uh, the records state we used more leeches, we used more everything. In fact, our first president, uh, who had a throat infection, died while being bled. And if you look at the records with how much blood he was, uh, was taken out of him, George Washington, uh, you can see where he was ex at least extremely weakened by the bloodletting itself, if not killed. So there's plenty of records and information about that. And you need to know that homeopaths in this world were also extremely uh, provident and moving people away in mainstream medicine from no longer using uh, bloodletting. I think it's a, a principal reason that, you know, we're criticized today and uh, we're trying, you know, they try to say we're not medically advanced uh, and, you know, criticized is to keep us from doing that again. And in reality, we should be doing it again. And I'll show you why right now. So bloodletting is very interesting. A little guy sits on a stool next to you. It's not always a doctor. He, what he does is he opens up a vein and he lets you take and uh, sit there for whatever ailment. It could be gout. It could be something else. A lot of different ailments uh, it will respond to and you'll see why. So you're bleeding and then all of a sudden the person gives a slight faint. right? And that's when they know when to stop 
taking off blood. So it has to actually get to the point where that individual sitting upright in a chair has so much blood removed that they at least have a slight faint to that, right? So they're going out and uh, then they stop the bleeding and then the person is, you know, left to rest and recuperate and the symptoms disappear. Why the symptoms disappear though is because basically they've put the person into a state of dealing with something much more immediately life-threatening than what they were dealing with. And that will vary from condition to condition, from pain to pain, of how much blood you need to take away before that becomes more immediately life-threatening. So this is going to be a really candid conversation and probably not too many people if they walk in on our conversation here and hear it, we'll be able to handle it because I just want to make sure you know how to protect yourself and that you understand exactly what is happening when people offer you a medication in the future because it's going to happen all your life, at least if mainstream medicine stays this, um, you know, dominant. So here we go. Again, we only respond to what we feel is most immediately life-threatening to us as a living community. And remember, if there's something like a pain hitting us and uh, we want to get relief, usually we create a craving for our own version of this. But in mainstream medicine, they use exactly the same thing. It comes right out of who we are, right out of a living community. So our bodies will respond the same way as if it is the food or the drug that we crave. Right? In the last video we talked about the craving. So if we have something hitting us here, right, a pain or a condition or you know hypertension or high cholesterol or these symptoms that are of our body, and then we go ahead and we um, we would normally get a craving for something, but that something would always be more immediately life-threatening. We'd take that in and temporarily it reduces this. Well, what mainstream medicine does is just take advantage of that fact. They just take and grab something, um, you know, all the TV ads. There's never a TV ad that doesn't ramble some horrific possibilities. Uh, there's not a single drug that doesn't come on, that doesn't take and have, uh, you know, <laughs> usually at some point more of a cost uh, mainstream medicine calls uh, these unwanted responses side effects, but there's no such thing as a side effect. There's only other effects. So eventually, they're going to happen. And if they happen, and the solution is you either got to give up that drug and go to another one, or you got to get another drug to handle the side effects of that one. But let's see how ridiculous that is. So if the reason that that drug works, just like our cravings for something that's always more immediately life-threatening to distract us from whatever that is, then we're always taking something that is more immediately life-threatening to us than the actual condition. And taking it over time doesn't result in a side effect. It results in one of those other effects, it's going to get us, right? And then, of course, if you take another one on top of that, it's got to be something else. So I want you to understand, this is not any different than the bloodletting that was there before. The bloodletting basically creates a stronger disease condition so that an individual will not feel the weaker disease is how Hahnemann used to describe it or other homeopaths used to describe it. So the stronger disease would dominate, like the old, you know, hit your toe with a hammer uh, so you don't have your headache feeling. And so if you keep taking that drug, it's another reason the drugs have to be constantly taken. Otherwise, once they wear off, just like a pain reliever, correct? but other medications for diabetes, for heart problems, it doesn't matter. If you have to keep taking it, this is the only way that it's working if you've got to keep taking it, insulin included. It's got to literally attack another part of your body in order and killing cells, causing another condition 
in order for your body to be distracted and not feel or not respond with the same symptoms. Now, how healthy is that? To attack your body in some other location. Now, that won't um, kill you right away, right? You'd think maybe it would, but it doesn't. What it does is it attacks another area that's vulnerable, but not, of course, as vulnerable as the place that you are right now hurting or having a symptom. So it looks like it makes a change in your body. Your body changes its response, but it responds because that's more immediately life-threatening being attacked somewhere else. Over time, that eventually creates another pathological condition, another chronic condition, just as long as that drug, just like, you know, if you have alcoholism and eventually you get, you know, a heart disease, dementia, uh, smoking, it's the same thing, right? Smoking is an anti-anxiety drug. So people who take it, eventually, you know, they feel better with their anxiety, but eventually they get lung cancer or heart disease or any other kind of condition that wherever it attacks that person, their body. And genetics is absolutely crazy with how they're trying to utilize genetics. Genetics is just saying that, you know, as a different family, we're sensitive to certain things. Like in our family, the males are sensitive to alcohol. If they drink a lot of alcohol, they eventually have a heart attack or they die. I'm the only male in our family, on both sides of our families actually, for me to actually still be living at this age, both my uncles are dead, without having had a heart attack. And the reason is, is I don't drink alcohol very often, very, very infrequently but they would have it on a regular basis. It's not in my lifestyle. So you change your lifestyle, you change your genetic response. Genetics are turned on and off by your environment. It is not that you have the genes and you'll get the disease is the way they used to say about, talk about it. And even they had to change that about 30 years ago. So they know this, but yet they try to utilize genetics saying they know more of what's going to happen in the future, which is a lot of hogwash if they don't deal with your environment. So bloodletting um, is no different than what we have in mainstream medicine today. It's the same concept, only we're putting in more into the person, but the concept is it's got to be more immediately life-threatening. Let's use the example of something like a, uh, an antihypertensive drug, since a lot of people are on those, right? So your blood pressure goes up, and they think they're saving you from having a stroke, right? They're being so great for you. It's almost like you're taking a vitamin by having this uh, you know, antihypertensive drug. But let's look at them. So, and let's look at the actual uh, mechanism of actions that they talk about, and let's, tie, let's see how that actually uh, works out. Right up here, there's a feedback loop right here. Either carotid artery has a sensor. Your aorta, right out, coming out of your heart, has a sensor. Uh, the, the, their feedback loop, right? You have multiple feedback loops. Right on the kidneys, each, each artery going in has another feedback loop to regulate blood pressure. Uh, your kidneys regulate blood pressure with renin, a hormone, uh, the calcium channel blocker right through the gut. That's one of them as well. Then you have a, uh, an ACE inhibitor, which is a, a, an enzyme in the upper part of your lungs. That's a, you know, all these areas of your body, none of them could actually function properly without the blood pressure being at a certain level. They would, or else they would die. If they didn't have blood, they'd die. So almost every organ and tissue in your body has a, a feedback loop telling it to regulate blood pressure. So how could a single one of those feedback loops, a single one of them, ever control every, all your blood pressure? How could it do that? It can't. It's impossible. It's ridiculous to use a mechanism of action and believe it. The only mechanism of action, if you want to say it as one, is actually the you know, response that we talk about. Your body only responds to what it feels is most immediately life-threatening. So you pump that drug up enough to where it causes another, but more 
immediately life-threatening condition to your body, and then your body listens as a community of living creatures, tissues. Otherwise, it wouldn't respond. And in fact, sometimes you have to use more than one blood pressure medicine to get it to respond, to create a condition strong enough, dangerous enough for your body to be more immediately life-threatening. Now take that in. That's not something to do lightly. In order to get well with mainstream medicine, the majority of the time we have to take something that attacks us. That's a high majority of the time too. Long term, that creates another chronic condition. It creates more pathology. It does not create a side effect. It creates another effect, a chronic condition. So to have that as a choice really for me is no choice unless I had no other choice. But there's a lot of choices out there. There's a lot of great things to help us. And the biggest change is finding out what's causing it, what is in our lifestyle that our genes are responding to. Take the alcohol away on a daily, regular basis, and we don't have heart attacks in my family. I'm the living proof for that. That's health. That's healing. Not taking something 